He's a much more avid bike rider than me. And uh, I'm just a prideful man that think I can do something until I realize I can't. So he's very gracious. And so we went out and I noticed the way he was always behind me. And so as he's behind me, he doesn't know this, but I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to keep going because I want to quit, right? And he doesn't know it, but I'm looking behind me because he's pushing me. He's pushing me. And then we got on this one strip, and I hear him say, I love this. And I'm like, bro, this is killing me. He gets in front of me, and he just starts going. And I just sat there, and as he was going ahead of me, for me, it was one of the best things because that's what he's been for me. He's been one who's always stood behind me, cheering me on and telling me you can go. But more than anything else, he's always been that one in front of me that made me want to say, I want to get where he's going. And so I want to present to you all my buddy and my boss, Pastor Donnell Jones. Oh. The Morrisons are amazing. I want you to take a moment just to applaud the God who gave you them as your leaders. Wow. I've been given an assignment. Uh, Pastor Darrell asked me to speak about who we are. And so that's what I'm going to do. Uh, this is us. Talk about who we are. If you were with us this year, we were in Orlando, Florida for our world conference. How many got to go to that? Yeah. Extraordinary moment. There were from 80 plus nations around the world. And you get 5,000 people in the room and you look left and you see Nigeria, you look right and you see Australia, you look behind you and you see Asia go, this is what heaven looks like. And it was a moment of celebrating 25 years of every nation, the family of which we are a part of that's global. And um, during the conference, there was an opportunity to pray for nations. Some of us were asked to pray and uh, I was asked to pray for North America. And as I began to pray for North America, the first people I prayed for were the Native Americans because they were the first here. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Um, I think that's significant, especially being here and, um, in, in Phoenix, Arizona. And so um, this is us. That's the title. This is us. And I want to kind of frame it a little bit. Um, so I celebrated a birthday recently with my family. Uh, we went out to a restaurant. It was Asian, a place I like in Bowie, Maryland, and enjoying time and dinner with the family. And while we were there, um, my wife asked our server her name, and she said her name was Flower. And she was Asian in appearance. And my wife said, is that your real name? And she said, no, that's not my real name. My wife said, well, what's your real name? She said, my real name is Manayan. My wife said, Manayan? She said, no, Manayan. So then my wife said, and I said, Manan? She said, no, Manan. <laughs> now, two of our daughters um, speak Mandarin Chinese. And so when she said Manan again, one of my daughters, the youngest, said Manan. And the server, Flower, went, yes, that's it. <laughs> and I knew right then. <laughs> my, uh, the two daughters who speak Mandarin to one another as Flower walked away from our table, because we didn't call her Manan, we called her Flower for the rest of the night. <laughs> <laughs> what we learned in that moment was, my daughter said to me, said, Dad, Americans, we speak mostly from our throat, but Asians speak from the front of their mouth, and their tongue actually forms a certain tone when it hits the teeth and all that above me. I don't know, you know. But when she said it, I could see my daughter's uh, mouth and tongue, and I realized even though I thought I was hearing what she heard, she could say back exactly what she heard. I said back what I thought I heard. So I'm asking the Holy Spirit, 
that whatever I say, that he's saying, that when I say, this is us, you say, that's good. Let's try it again. This is us. No, this is us. No, this is us. No, this is us. Okay, that's it. You with me now? What I'm trying to say to you is that when the moment I have here to talk about who we are, when I say this is us, however you hear it, you need to ask the Holy Spirit to actually tell you what he's really saying so that you don't walk away with your own idea of who we are instead of his idea of who we are. So when we talk about this is us, um, I want to show you this image because... Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.9, he says, we are God's co-workers. You are God's field, God's building. You are God's field, God's building. He uses imagery to discuss, to describe who we are. We are God's field, God's building. Two analogies. When you talk about uh, God's field, you're referring, you're referring to something that's organic. Uh, a field requires cultivation. When you say you're God's building, you're speaking about that which is more organizational and it requires construction. So, but we're both, the church is both organic and organizational. How many in this room are more organic and relational? Let me see your hands, right? How many of you are more organizational? You want the process and the details, right? And so sometimes the organic and organizational people start talking to each other like, no, this is who we are. We're both. And when you start to understand that God wants you to live in the radical middle, you begin to flow in who we really are. So this is us. And I'm going to walk through some of this. And uh, I want to say this as well. You know, when the Holy Spirit sent uh, Pastor Daryl and Joanne Morrison, uh, their children, Faith, Sammy, Gracie, Naomi, Ben, uh, and sent the team from D.C., it was one of those things that we did in obedience to God, but it was not easy to do because they were doing so well in D.C. They didn't leave because of any problems. They left because the Holy Spirit said, go. And we cried the day they left. In fact, we cried a few times because we love one another. We have such close relationship. And when he first got here, he thought, man, I, should I have really come? And then I'd like, should I really have sent him? <laughs> It's like my right arm is gone, and I'm, I'm still pastoring now, and one arm less. And, but when I come and see you, you know why I'm encouraged? Because if we did not send them, I wouldn't have the privilege of seeing you. If we did not send them, I wouldn't hear reports of people who have recently committed their lives to Jesus, people who were born again, people who were baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit, people who are serving and doing things. Valley Gate Church would not exist if we were saying this is us when God was saying this is us. They had to agree with God's this is us, not their own this is us, because if they held to their own this is us, their own Manaean, they'd still be in D.C. But God said Manaean, they said Manaean. He said, that time you got it, now go. Now, I encourage you because some of you showed up here and God still saying, this is us. And you're saying, yeah, Pastor Demo, this is us. And he's like, no, this is us. Like, no, this is us. Let me tell you how you know this is us. It's usually God asking you to do something that you aren't inclined to do. It's not on your list. You come to Valley Gate, oh, I love the church. This is good. Great worship. Great preaching. This is good. Hey, can you help out? In, uh, 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 I don't, I'm not really here for all that. I just... He had to come all the way from D.C. We're just asking you to go upstairs. How hard is your this is us? What kind of aid do you need for your hearing to get you going? And let me tell you, it's hard to hear, but it's so good to hear. And like I said, I wept when they left. I told my wife, we crazy. But I don't feel crazy anymore when I see you. I don't even know all your names, but I know you're us. Because the DNA that's in our spiritual family, the DNA that was in Pastor Brett who planted us, the DNA that's in us that planted you guys is the same DNA that's in you. And you might not even know who you are fully because I'm still figuring out who I am fully, but I know this is us. Can I show you a picture of yesterday since he talked about it? We went bike riding, and this is at the start of the trip. That is uh, me on the far left, Pastor Demo. Then next to him is Tommy Claiborne, and then next to Tommy is Tommy's brother, uh, Jelani. Now, 
That's the four of us at the start. Let me tell you, when you plant this church and you say, we're going to win Phoenix, that's what it looks like at the beginning. <laughs> you ain't even left yet, but you smiling, you got your helmet on, you got your shades, you got your bike, you're wearing pads. And some of us, have, we've all ridden bikes, but the experience, some more, some less. But we're all going to go together. Some of us have the shoes where you click in, and so your foot becomes part of the pedal system. How many know what I'm talking about? Right? That's a lot of us had that. Some of us just had our sneakers, but we were all riding together. You know, in this room, so there's experience, some more, some less, but we're all going to ride together. And those who have more experience still have something to learn, but they can give to the, those who have less experience to encourage them. You don't walk around like, yeah, I got click-ins. Are you kidding me? <laughs> we don't win unless we all get there together. Why are you looking at your click-ins? You need to really click in. I'm not talking about your shoes. I'm talking about your heart. So we, we got out riding, and I tell you what, it was really an experience. Um, we were given a navigational unit that was to help us go. And one of the first images, since he talked about images, one of the first images that I remember was looking and watching Jelani and watching Pastor Demo. Tommy was right in there too. I was just a little ahead of him. We were all stopped. And they were looking at it and they both said it. This is us right here. This is us. This is us. And I was like, "Woo! they preaching my message already. <laughs> Go on and preach. That's confirmation I'm supposed to preach this message. I didn't tell them to say this is us. This navigational unit has our entire route mapped out, shows us the route we're supposed to get on. By the way, it took us eight miles just to get to the starting point. Now, if you can't hear what I'm saying, some of you up here, when are we going with you? It's going to take you a while to get started. It takes, we're 20 years in in D.C., and I feel like sometimes we're just getting started. So we're, we're, we're looking at it and go, this is us, this is us. And I don't know the number of times that Jelani stopped and said, hold up, hold up. Yeah, this is us. Yeah, hold up. Yeah. We didn't ride the route and go, we should just go here, we should go there. We were following a navigational unit. We weren't trying to do our own thing or think, well, I think we should go this way or that way. We're saying this is us. And we never make a move without seeing who we are. You got a lot of good ideas. You came here. You're like, we should do this in our church, and we should do this in our church. Can I tell you, there's a navigational unit called the Holy Spirit, and he says, this is us, this is us. And if you're called to be at Valley Gate, then you have to say, this is us. I know you got great ideas, but the author of ideas is God, and the only way there's unity, all of us didn't have a navigational unit. There was only one, and it was on Jelani's bike. And even though I could ride, I had to get in line and follow the guy who had the unit. You got to line up behind the Morse and say, they're following the Holy Spirit. This is us. We're going to follow them. That's how it works. I don't know if I want to do that, though. You know, he played for the Washington Redskins. There are players who play for different teams. But if you leave the Cowboys and you go play for the Redskins and say, this is how we did the Cowboys, then you need to go back to the Cowboys because you ain't a Cowboy no more. You're a Redskin. And now that you're Redskin, this is how Redskins do it. So when you come to Valley Gate, I know you came from a lot of great churches, and that's wonderful. But when you came to Valley Gate, if God called you, then you have to go, that was then, this is now, this is who we are. You have to buy in. You have to go, that's who we are. Mm. This is us? This is us? No. This is us? No, not quite. This is us? Yeah, that's it, that's it. So when you get asked, can you serve here? You're like, this is us. I'm going to wait. Yeah, yeah, I'm waiting. See, the amen means you agree. So when you're asked to serve somewhere in this house or go serve on the campus, go do something, you're going to say, yeah, this is us. Okay, we got 10% more amens on that one. I'll come back to it later, a little later on, but now you know. All right? Still with me? So we started enjoying this ride, and there were all kinds of things along the ride. Um, brakes rubbing on the bike. Pastor Demo's bike, the brakes were rubbing the tire the whole trip. He didn't even know it. Working harder than he had to. Some of you are working harder than you need to. Some of you are working harder than you need to. Um, we, we had all kinds of things. Um, I'm going to come back to some of those things. Um, but this is us. Go back to the, the screen. And I've got to make sure I tie this to who we are so you get this picture. And this is a lot of content to get in one moment. This literally would be like a five-week series. So this is just going to fly in at 50,000 feet. Right? This is not... 
I, I did this in our church back home, and I did it in five to six weeks. So you're getting it in five minutes. So it's hard to digest. But the first thing, if this is us, I, I want you to see the pillars and the, all this. So we're going to break this down. The first thing you want to understand is our purpose. We need to know why we exist, right? So purpose is at the bottom. This is why we exist. We exist to honor God. That's, that's who we are. We exist to honor God. And how do we do that? We exist to honor God by planting or establishing Christ-centered, spiritually empowered, socially responsible churches and campus ministries in every nation. That's who we are, our global family in 80 nations around the world. So if you come to Valley Gate, you need to know this is the family of which you're a part of. So you're like, why are we planting churches? Because that's who we are. They're Christ-centered, spiritually empowered, socially responsible churches and campus ministries in every nation around the world. So that's the bedrock in turn. And the thing we exist to honor God, this is important. We need to ask ourselves the question, God, are you honored? David said, let the meditation of my heart and the words of my mouth be pleasing and acceptable. Do my thoughts honor you, God? Do my words honor you? Are my actions honor you? The way I spoke to my spouse, my child, the way I spoke to my employer, my employee, the way I related to people in the church, are you honored by my communication? Are you honored by the habits in my life? See, if the goal is to honor God, then almost no one needs to tell you what you need to do. Secondly, after the purpose... Then let's jump up to the priorities. I've already said them, but our priorities are church planting, uh, campus uh, ministry, social responsibility, and world missions. We're engaged in all these things. Church planting, uh, campus ministry, social responsibility, world missions. I'll just touch on some briefly. Let's go back to front. World missions. We do something called 10 days. So we actually send a team from Grace Covenant Church out here 10 days to go outreach in the community and on the campus. Why do we do that? Because we're interested in world missions. They could be around the country, around the continent, everywhere. We go to South Africa, all these places. Again, 50,000 feet. Social responsibility, wow, there's so many things there. Homelessness, uh, sex trafficking, all these kinds of issues. You've got to figure out locally, what does that mean here in Phoenix? What are we going to address? Campus ministry. So campus ministry. Pastor Brett Fuller, who pastored both of us, uh, sent me out uh, in 1999 to start a church just like this one got started. And uh, he had been the chaplain at Howard University with the football team, and there was a campus ministry. He turned it over to a guy named J.C. Sherrod, and then J.C. did some other things, and they got turned over to me. So we started reaching the football team. And then one day I said, Daryl, come with me to the campus. He had retired from playing uh, with the Redskins. He'd done some corporate work, ended up working with Pastor Brett, being a, an assistant chaplain to the Redskins, going right back to the field he had worked. And then... Uh, Pastor Brett said, what do you think about being a pastor? He went, what? It's like, go call Donnell. He called me I'm like, yeah, come on. So he came a bit. They came and said yes to come down to D.C. And uh, when they got there, he started helping me outreach at Howard. We would go together because some things are taught, some things are caught. And when you do life together, Joanne and I were talking about this. I don't want to give it away. She's got an amazing Bible study coming up. Y'all going to love it. It's just the bomb. I've already got the, the preview, but I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. But anyway... So I'm going to skip that point because then it would give it away. So the whole point was as you're walking together and doing life together, God does amazing things. So one day it was time for us to go to the outreach at Howard, and I called him on my cell phone. He was on the way. I said, I'm not coming today. He said, what? I didn't tell him to prepare or anything. He was, he was coming just to like he knew I was going to speak. He's going to be there. I said, you got it. I got it. You got it. So he went and had to leave that day, and I said, by the way, I'm not coming back anymore, it's yours. So he, that's how he, now that's not the best way to do it, but that's how he became, (laughs) that's the way way he's going to do it. That's how he became the leader. It grew, they had 80 people in their home that were university students from all over. It started at Howard, but it went to GW and Georgetown and AU and all these different schools and University of Maryland where we are now. So all that happened. We've got full-time campus missionaries in our church, and you are going to have full-time campus missionaries. How many feel called to go into full-time ministry and serve the campus? Awesome. Awesome. I'll start with one hand. I'm going to come back one day. It's going to be 15 full-time campus missionaries on this church. 15. You're going to be standing up here. I'm at ASU. I'm at U of A. Can I? This is painful. This is us. This is us. No, this is us? us. Almost. This is us? us. That's good. This is how I know this is us is still working in his heart. He went to U of A, played football, outstanding athlete. He did so great that when his son Sammy was being recruited and had said yes to Duke, they brought him and Sammy, the whole family, to U of A, throwback Thursdays. Am I right? They showed him in his jersey back in his day. 
when he had a 24-inch waist. And, 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 and they had him in his jersey, and they stood Sammy like, Sammy, you know who that is? That's your daddy. Then they gave him his father's jersey, took him down on the field, and said, this is where your daddy did his best work. And Sammy, I'm like, man, y'all recruiters, y'all know how to do it, coaches. He's like, I ain't going to Duke. I'm going to U of A. But here's the, it's in the blood. He went to U of A. His son went to U of A. He comes plant the church, and God says, now go serve ASU. This is, us? this is us? That's his Nineveh. <laughs> You're going to get that later. Someone's going to explain it to you. <laughs> you. Do you get that? You don't go to school and wear the logo and everything and then go to your rival and say, I'm here to serve you unless you hear this is us. And if he can do it and is called to do it, then guess who else is? Mm. Say it like you mean it. This is us. This is us. See that? You're going to go serve somewhere that you think you ought not. But because this is us, you're going. Is this helping anybody? All right, I got to move faster. Where do we leave off? Campus, uh, ministry, church planting. We were a church plant. Uh, Pastor Vincent, I don't even know where he is. Oh, he's standing in the back. Pastor Vincent was one of the first church planters out of our church. Uh, Y'all love Pastor Vincent and Cecile? They're great. I could tell stories about them. We went running together and jogging and praying together, so many things. This guy is responsible for me being on the setup team at our church. I wasn't even pastoring. I was new to the church. He came to me and said, hey, do you want to be on crew? I was like, what's crew? We're the guys who get up at 6 in the morning. I stopped listening after he said 6 in the morning. <laughs> we come to the church early. We set up everything and prepare for people because we were meeting in hotels. And so I was a little religious guy because I grew up in church. And so I was like, okay, I'm new. I'm back to God. Like I was just fresh and I love Jesus. I'm going to go hard for you. When he asked me to serve Jesus, I was like, um, let me pray about it. You, never, you know when you say let me pray about it, but that's really cold for how do I end this conversation and move on? You know what I'm talking about? Richard, you know what I'm talking about? He's over there laughing next to Chelsea. So I, I said, let me pray about it. Then he came right back the next week said, did you pray about it? I'm like, this dude is crazy. He's going to come back and ask me if I prayed about it just because I said, let me pray about it. What kind of church is this where they ask you, did you pray when you said you were going to pray? Oh, it might be a real church. It might be a real church. So then I was like, okay, let me reach my, my, my dictionary of Christian words. Y'all, y'all know Christian stuff. Like, we, we weren't born Christian. Pastors weren't born. Say, so we know the game. Oh, oh, this is a good one. I don't feel led. Ooh, that's a good one. That's a good one right there. That's a good one. I don't feel led. I don't feel, oh, Lord Jesus bless you. Hallelujah. I don't feel led of God, right? And Pastor Vincent, I'm 6'4". He's not. (laughs) So I just thought my height alone going to be like, you know, he just kind of stepped close. He didn't step back. I was like, step back. He stepped up and said, I think you need to get the lead out. I made the best friends of my life. It wasn't just about serving. Serving is where God builds you into his house. It's where you begin to understand this is us. If you only come on Sunday and leave, come and leave, good, I'm glad you're here. But then you got to take the next step and start serving because those people I served with became my friends. In my moment of crisis, in my moment of celebration, that was my small group. When I talked about the fact that I had a son, when I talked about the fact that I had flunked out of college, I wasn't living alone anymore. This is us. And my life changed. I got, because they prayed, my son got back into my life. Because they prayed, I went back to college and graduated. Because they prayed, I married a woman who accepted my son. Because they prayed, the rest is history. You don't know what you're missing by not serving. We're not asking for a favor. We're giving you an opportunity to become something. This is us. This is how we grew up. All day, this is where we live. So don't look at him like he's funny. What is he talking about? You come to D.C., you'll see exactly what he's talking about. You go to Chantilly, Virginia, you'll see exactly what he's talking about. This is us. It's like going to a family reunion. This is your cousin. That's my cousin. Oh, he ride a bike too? Yeah, we all ride bikes. We on this ride together. I'm tired. That's all right. We'll get you some water. All right, let's go. I got to move faster. Now, 
for those of you excited, yeah, I want to go church plan. I want to do campus ministry. I want to do social responsibility, world, world, world missions. I'm glad you do, but we want to get you ready. You see there are four pillars in this room? Do you see them? If you're sitting next to a pillar, hit it so everybody can see it. There we go. That ain't moving. That's not going anywhere. You don't even pay attention to the pillars when you walk in this room. In fact, you walk around them. The very thing you walk around is the thing that's holding this thing up. Before the carpet was laid, before the stage was built, before it was painted, those pillars were here. They actually painted the pillars just so it blend in. But before the whole structure went up, there's like, there's some pillars on which this structure stands. And let me tell you, they bang these things down. They're not just in the floor, they're in the earth. You can't move it. They usually have pylons. Kapoom, 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 kapoom. You know that noise, like, what are they doing? I am, it's loud, I'm trying to sleep. Kapoom. You're trying to sleep, but when you walk in that thing, you want it to hold up. That's the sound of the thing that is a core value that's so deeply rooted that when you're talking to somebody, you don't even know it's in them. We got five core values, pillars that are in us. Here's the first one, lordship. Lordship is a core value for us. It's a core value for our global family. Lordship means we value obedience to God. Jesus said, I delight to do your will. And because we are followers of Jesus and we follow him, that means we want to come to the point of obeying him from the heart. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. And, and I want to drill down on this one a little bit. I won't drill down on the other so much. But so that none of us gets a spiritual hernia, I think it's important to, to say something about lordship. So this verse in John chapter uh, 14, verses 15 through 17, it says, if you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate or comforter to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of truth, that's the Holy Spirit. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. This is amazing. Right after Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He's just asked you to do something that's humanly impossible. How many have come to the point where realizing the commandments of God and keeping them are literally, humanly speaking, impossible? So right after that, he says, I'm going to give you another helper, the Holy Spirit, because he realized it's the Holy Spirit in us that when we open up like we sang today and allow the Holy Spirit to come into us, he's the one who actually empowers us to live godly. I can't live godly by Donnell. Donnell's propensity when I wake up in the morning is to go not toward God, but to drift away from him. But the Holy Spirit draws me near to him and says, me, the third person of the Trinity, will empower you to be a witness for me in Phoenix, Arizona, and everywhere else. The only way I live godly is with the help of the Holy Spirit. If I am doing it on my own, I'm straining to no avail. you got to welcome the Holy Spirit into your life. And so our obedience to Jesus that is, is, is tied to our relationship with the Holy Spirit, who himself is God. Amen? Amen? All right. So let's go to the next one. All right. Discipleship. So discipleship, spin that around for me. Spiritual growth. We value spiritual growth. Discipleship is relationship. I know you've heard that. It's relationship with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're invited to this intimacy with the triune God who is uh, one being, three persons, and we're invited to the dance. And so, but it's not only relationship with God, it's relationship here with other brothers and sisters, and it's also relationship outreaching to the world and the community around us. So this is so important. The next pillar. Next pillar is evangelism. We value lost people right? We value people who don't know God. On our bike ride yesterday, we engaged and interacted with people who were just sitting on their lawns or hanging around. It's amazing when you're on the bike and you're out, you're not in the car, you just see people, you start talking to them, they engage in conversations. It was a lot of fun. So we value lost people. Uh, the next one, leadership development. This is a core value for us. We're very intentional about equipping and developing you to be a leader. Uh, we, we, do you know where we find leaders? sitting in the chairs where you are. You're the leaders. You may not even see yourself as a leader, but I want you to know that when we are looking for leaders, we're not looking outside these doors. We're looking right here in this room. 
And leadership is really about serving. Jesus says, servants are the greatest. And so he's like, they were arguing one day, the disciples, who's the greatest? He says, the greatest among you is a servant of all. Leadership is just serving. It's just serving. You know what? Preaching on Sunday is the same thing as washing dishes. I'm serving this morning. I'm just washing a plate. I'm just washing a cup right now. That's all I am doing. Pastor Brett taught us, you need to be ready to hold the microphone as easy as you're willing to hold the toilet brush. Man, he drilled that into us. It's all serving, right? But for the brother who just wants the mic, let me sing, let me preach, but won't take the toilet brush, that's a character issue. Talent will only take you so far. Some of the most talented NFL players are unemployed right now because of character. You need character. I'll take character over gifting any day. All right, what's the last one? Family. We value family. We will not sacrifice our families and our relationships on the altar of ministry. We are committed to spiritual family. Like, like, can I just be real? This dude is my road dog. Every Tuesday, we met one-on-one, open, transparent, talking about our lives. How's your marriage? How your kids? How you living? What you watching on TV? Who you talk to this week? Like, you don't have to worry about the guy who's preaching, and he's talented and anointed and gifting, he's faithful to his wife. His wife's faithful to him. They've raised godly kids. They made a sacrifice to come here. They left their friends behind, crying. The team that came out here, Sarah Munyon, Sarah Munyon standing in the back. I, the first time I met uh, Sarah was when we were plant churching, church planting in Philadelphia. She's taking care of my kids because we were probably the only people with kids in the church, and our kids were three years old. Now our kids are in their 20s, and she's known them that long. London Finley. Man, I just, all these people here made a sacrifice to come, and it's family. It's who we are. You're a spiritual family. You're not just visitors or guests. If if God's your father, then you are sitting next to your brother or sister. It's family. And so we're there for one another. Amen? Amen. All right. Um, I want to give you some of these things. As we wrap up, under our value of evangelism, because God's heart is to reach the lost, we're passionate about preaching the gospel and doing ministry in a way that engages people outside of the Christian faith, outside of Valley Gate. We seek to build churches primarily through evangelism, not transfer, through birth, not adoption. I'm glad for everybody who's here who came through another church, but our church, honestly, is not looking to go fish in an aquarium. We're trying to go to the ocean. Amen. Can I, can I tell you, there are people, how many of you are saved? Just raise your hand. How many people regularly interact with people who are not saved? Those are the people who God has on his heart and wants you to have on, on, on your heart. And you begin to just do life with them. And in the course of doing life, something comes up where you just get to open up and talk about who you are and what Jesus did in your life. And before you know it, they're going to have a relationship with God. You're going to see them coming into relationship with God, coming into this church, coming into a small group. That's how it really happens. I want you this week, here's a homework assignment. I will not be back next week to check. I want you to tell someone this week your story about how you connected with Jesus. I don't care if you take them to Starbucks or y'all have Panera Bread. I don't know if y'all have Panera Bread. Wherever you go, take someone. How many, raise your hand if you're going to do that this week. Now, don't lie. All right, take a picture, everybody. Somebody take a picture. Hang on, on, keep your hands up. Put your hands up again. Hold on. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to send this to him. He saw your hand. He can blow the picture up and just call on you in mid-service. So tell me whose story, who you talked to about Jesus this week. It should be normal for you to talk about Jesus. It's normal for you to talk about you. But there's no you without Jesus, so talk about the one who made you you. This is us. us. There's nothing more rewarding. There might be, but there are few things more rewarding than to see someone's life change because God touched them through you. All right, good. Um, Discipleship. Because we're called to make disciples, our primary focus is establishing biblical foundations, equipping believers to minister, and empowering disciples to make disciples, not conducting meetings, facilitating programs, or building buildings. That's not our primary reason. I grew up thinking church was just Sunday. I didn't know it was a life. 
leadership. Because we're called to establish churches and campus ministries in every nation, we're committed to a culture of empowering leadership. That's what that women's Bible study is. That's what that men's Bible study is. We're intentionally multi-generational, and we deliberately create opportunities and platforms to develop the next generation. Family. Because the family is the foundation and validation of ministry, we refuse to sacrifice our marriages and our children on the altars of temporal success. And because we believe God has called us to be a spiritual family, we embrace community, we reject the idea of disposable relationships, and choose to walk in love, respect, and unity. Let me tell you how this works, family and lordship. Because they all go together. It's not like, okay, I got that pillar, I got that pillar. Once all the pillars in your life, they work together like seamlessly. See, spiritual family, when you get mad at somebody and you don't want to talk to them no more, because lordship, Jesus says, follow me. And Luke chapter 6, I hear you, Jerome. Luke chapter 6, Jesus says, do good to haters. Now, if Jesus is Lord, since he treats those who hate him with kindness, since we follow him, then we treat people who hate us with. How many say that's hard to do? That's why it's impossible. It's not hard. So that's why you have to have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit dwelling in you so that you don't live like you, but you live like him. And the moment you actually show kindness to somebody who hates you, you all start, you don't have to go, what would Jesus do? You start saying, I'm experiencing Christ in me doing what he's always been doing. Don't set the bar low. Don't go for flour. Stay with Manan. <laughs> Manan is do good to haters. Treat them the way they treat you. That's flour. Give to those who can't pay you back, and you know they won't. Manan. You better give me my money back, flour. <laughs> if you say you follow him, where you trip up, you better say, I ain't following you as well as I should. But I'm not going to just pout about it. I'm going to say, I need more transformation. Love the lost. I don't want to talk to no stranger. Flower. I'm not, I'm not good at making disciples. I will empower you and equip you. You know this one thing about the bike ride? The bike does all the work. Some of us out there were working too hard. <gasps> Me and Jelani like, man, this is so great. What's the difference? First of all, riding the brakes. Some of you need to stop riding the brakes. You're here at Valley Great, but you're pumping the brakes. Worship was good. That's as far as I'm going to go. What you doing? Nah, Pastor, uh, Pastor uh, Dare, I need to fix my bike. I'll be with you later. Keep going. See, family's there when you break down. Look at this picture. We were riding. This is probably after that moment I sped ahead. I must have did something. I don't know what. But I lost pressure in my front tire. And when I hit the brake, my bike felt more like a dirt bike. It was spinning out. I was in trouble. That's usually when people go quiet and don't say anything. But out loud in the crowd, I said, guys, I just lost pressure. And you know what they said? Let's pull over. Some of you are suffering in this church, and you've lost pressure. But it's just because, but you're not alone. You don't realize you just need to say, hey, small group, hey, Pastor V, hey, hey, I lost pressure. Pull over. And, and. We were trying to fix it, and both Jelani and I were looking for the inner tube in the tire, and this one had no inner tube. This was like a, this bike was imported from Italy. Like, I've never been on a bike like this before in my life. We were riding some serious machines. He was on an $11,000 bike. It had Bluetooth to change the gears. This is like crazy <laughs> stuff. Yeah, it's crazy. I was on a $5,000 bike. Jelani was on a $5,000 bike. Uh, Tommy was probably like a $10,000. I don't know what. But we had to use a CO2 and, and July and I had had experience unsuccessfully with our bikes. I had used a CO2 cartridge before, and it didn't work. He did the same thing. It didn't work. So we both looked at each other like, all right, we're going to try this. And we put it on. Pop! We're like, yeah, that pop was good because it meant air came back in. I want you to know that when you lose pressure, there's a CO2 cartridge called the Holy Spirit 
that you might need help from somebody in this church that when you pull over, but something will pop inside of you and you'll be inflated. You don't have to walk around with an imploded soul. And all of a sudden you're riding again. They said, D, how you doing? I'm like, I'm riding. I'm back at it. Somebody hurt your feelings. Somebody didn't pay you what you were owed. Somebody treated you wrong. Somebody did you wrong. Somebody fired you. You didn't get the promotion. You just need to pull over for a moment and get a little CO2 of the Holy Spirit. Pop and keep riding because that's what followers of God do. We keep riding. We keep riding. I'm hurt, but I'm riding. And we stayed together. So we got back on our bike and we continued to ride and we were celebrating. And then we got back to the end of the ride. And this is the end shot. This is when it was all over. We're having peanut butter and jelly sandwiches that were grilled. They made it at the bike shop. When I was a kid, I made hot pot, uh, peanut butter, and I called it a hamalasi sandwich. It was my own creation. I made it up. Now they're selling it. I, like, I had no idea that I could, didn't have to be poor. I should have been selling hamalasi sandwiches. <laughs> so he takes a picture. This is after the ride. We made it back, y'all. Yeah. This is more than 20 miles we rode. Your pastor ain't been on a bike. Tommy ain't been on a bike, but they rode 20 miles because they were riding with other people. You'll go further than you will ever go by yourself if you ride with others. Who are you riding with? You can't be in just an individual. God's called us to be a community, and you got to open up. So this is uh, how I'm going to land this thing. Go to the last picture. That's the map. That's where we rode. That's 20 miles all around. I want you to know that that route is waiting for you to ride. This is the city that we're called to win. You didn't show up here just to receive. You came here to receive so that you could get to a city that desperately needs God. And a family and a few people said yes and showed up, and now all of you are here. In less than four years, you have, by the Spirit of God, produced what most churches don't do in 10 years. You have no idea the grace of God that's on your life. If you're too busy looking at yourself, you're missing. Change of view. Who's ready to take and win this city? This is us. This is us. Okay, now let me tell you. Six, seven years ago, my wife bought me a bike. I hadn't ridden since I was 13 years. Got it for me on my birthday. And uh, the family got in the car and drove to Potbelly. That's where I wanted to go for my, my birthday. Nice restaurants all the time, but we went to Potbelly. I passed them while I was on my bike. And uh, I told my wife, this is great. Well, I've upgraded now. Now I have a carbon fiber bike. Like you can lift it with your finger. It's just, it's not $11,000, but it's a very nice bike. I got the click-ins and everything. I was telling Jelani the other day, yesterday. When I was a kid, you know how I used to just take the cap off and then put the nozzle on and blow it up? That was the bike I grew up on. This bike is different, but I just... My old mindset thought that you get air in your bike the same way. So I kept putting the air, the pump, over the needle, and I go, ksh, 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 ksh. The sound of that air was so encouraging. It's like, yeah, I'm filling my, my tires. And then I go riding, but I, was, I felt like my ride was bumpier than it should be and harder than it should be. Finally, I got a flat tire, and then I, I went to this shop to get help because I was pumping on my own. The guy said, you don't have a flat tire. I said, what? He said, no, go ahead, put the air in. And so I put the nozzle off. He says, no, 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 take the nozzle off. He said, you see this cap? There's a little nozzle you twist. It doesn't come off. You just twist it open, and when the valve is open, then the air goes in. Now, I'm a, this is embarrassing, but for the first six months I'm pumping, I'm heating the air, and ain't nothing going in the tire because the valve cap was closed. Pastor Demos preaching. Man, that's great word I heard today. How much of it going in? Here's what we sang. I wrote it down. Lord, I will open up again. I'll throw my fears into the wind. 
I'm desperate for a touch of heaven. I'm asking that you would open the valve so that the Holy Spirit can enter in and fill you up so that you can enjoy the ride of your life of Valley Gate winning Phoenix, Arizona, winning Tempe, winning Glendale, winning Scottsdale. Just start with your neighbor. Just start with that one person you're going to talk to this week. This is us. Flower. Would you stand? I think there's some here this morning, and this is a moment, as Pastor Darrell said earlier, during the time that we were singing, open up the vow. How many would just say, I need to open the vow wide open? I don't want to just go by flower. I want to go by Manan. Hold your hands high. Holy Spirit, would you please give us the grace to open the valve of our heart, to open the heart valve, open the mind valve, and renew our mind, renew our heart, so that we would be so full of you. And like my bike, I have to put air in it regularly. May they may not think this is a one-time thing, but I regularly need to be filled with you so that I can ride together in this family called Valley Gate and, and ride out the route that you've marked out for us. And everybody who agreed with this said, amen. amen. Last time. This is us. This is us. Like you mean it. This is us. 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 Make some noise. I want you to go ahead and have your seat. I want us to, when we have guest speakers, we, we honor them. It's called an honorarium.